Hi, guys. I'm on my way. Hey, hey. hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, day number. What day is this? Let's see. This is day number 103 live, 103 days live in a row, and I've been here for you every every day at noon, and I am having a ball doing it. I enjoy it very much, and I thank you for tuning in. I am live in the Adirondack Mountains, and so somebody yesterday said, where is the Adirondack Mountains? Well, the mountains of the Adirondacks. The Adirondack is a... Um, a state park protected by the Constitution, which means it's it's pristine. And uh, essentially, they do allow homes and cities or towns in the state park, but they're very careful. For instance, uh, if you live on a lake like we do, you can't build anything new right on the lake. Uh, everything that was in place a long time ago, 100 years ago, is allowed and uh, it's a pretty cool place. It's about three times the size of, uh, it's like three national parks combined, one of the best kept secrets in America. They like it that way. They, they, uh, they don't want too many tourists up here. So uh, today, uh, day 103 live, we're going to talk about things that you can do, seven ways that you can become a known artist. And we're going to talk about that today. We're also going to talk about a few other things. And we have a guest today that will be coming in, and that will be John McDonald, the world-famous artist, uh, very well-known, well very accomplished, and the world's nicest guy. Now, uh, I'm up here, and forgive my mess, uh, <laughs> Lori brought me a gift yesterday, and it's an air conditioner. Uh, I'm on the second floor of this old building. This is a 140-year-old building. We have no air conditioning in the camp anywhere. And uh, to be up here, and I wanted to be up here so I could look at the lake and, the, and this uh, game room that doesn't get used very much. And so um, she brought me an air conditioner. So you can see boxes. I've been unpacking it and trying to figure out how to make it work. And uh, so maybe tomorrow I will be not sweating. All the windows are open. The fans are on. It's pretty crazy right now. So uh, today, let's talk about a couple of things. First off, we have, let me get rid of that. We have uh, videos for you every day at 3 p.m., brand new ones that we've not shown uh, that we started on July 1st. Um, or Yeah, July 1st. So today at 3 p.m., you'll see a video on either Streamline Art video on Facebook or YouTube. So you go to Facebook or YouTube, search Streamline Art video, and that's how you find the live, live broadcast. It is not here on this particular page, so keep that in mind. Now, today, uh, we got a good one for you today, and this is Randall Sexton, and uh, essentially, he's going to talk about brush strokes with energy and movement, and Randy Sexton is one of the first plein air artists I ever met. Uh, he was at a, an event called The Scene on the Strait in Martinez, California. And Randy's work blew me away. It's the first I'd ever been to a plein air event. I didn't even know what plein air was. And his work blew me away. So we became friends. Um, and we have uh, known each other a long, long time now. Anyway, he's done this fabulous video. And that's going to be today at 3 p.m. You'll get a chance to see that. So that is at Streamline Art Video and uh, Randall Sexton. So don't miss that at 3 o'clock. Also, uh, wanted to remind everybody that uh, I've got a blog called Sunday Coffee, and uh, I love to grow it. It's something that I think you might like, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. Now, today we're going to be giving away uh, two easel brush clips. The easel brush clip clips onto your easel. It's something that you can keep brushes in, and uh, that way you've got them right there at your eye level and you don't have to keep dropping them on the ground. And so I use them, as a matter of fact, last night I went painting and I forgot to take it and I was wishing I had it because I was digging around for my brushes and that wasn't a good thing. So um, anyway, that's something we'll be giving away today. The way to win that is for comments. Tell us where you're from. Uh, tell us if you're from another country, that's very helpful. I want to tell you a story. I'm not going to reveal any names because I think it would be inappropriate, plus I don't have permission. But uh, last night, I was checking my Instagram, and I, I got a, a really nice note from a young woman, and she said, uh, 
I have decided to take up plein air painting. I've been a painter for a lot of years, but I gave it up because I'm a mom and I'm, you know, dealing with being a mom. And she said her sister is a plein air painter in England and that her sister encouraged her to take up plein air painting because she is living in the United States. And of all things, she's living in the Adirondacks. And so uh, her sister says, well, you got to find this guy, Eric Rhodes. He's, you know, he's on live every day and he's, he's doing all this plein air stuff. And she reached out to me. And so it turns out not only do they live in the Adirondacks, they live on the same lake that we live on, like two minutes from here. And it uh, turns out that we know her in-laws. So that's pretty cool. And so I, I will be uh, having a new student. I'm going to do some lessons. And I'm pretty excited about that because I love to teach. It's also uh, twin, twin girls who are about 17, 18, about the age of my kids. And they're coming up to visit their grandfather for three weeks. And he has asked me, and they want me to give lessons. So I'm going to have some students this summer. That'll be kind of fun. But I will be going away uh, soon. I'm going to be leaving uh, leaving here Sunday and going back to our soundstage in Austin, Texas. And I will be conducting MCing Plein Air Live. Now, we've got a couple of days of rehearsal and more preparation. The team has been working on this for three solid weeks. Uh, it's amazing we put this together in, in such a short amount of time. And today is the last day that you can uh, save $100 on, on your booking. Now, uh, hundreds of people have signed up for this all over the world. And it is one week from today, right? Let's see. Let me look at my calendar. But yes, it, it is. Uh, it's one week from today. And actually, the beginner's day starts uh, on the 14th. So if you are learning plein air painting or you want to explore it or discover it, you really ought to go on the beginner's day because it's going to teach you about how to paint real, real basic. You know, we keep it real simple, how to paint in uh, watercolor, pastel, oil, um, uh, what have I forgotten, gouache, and, uh, and whatever else. Uh, yeah, anyway, we're going to teach you those things, plus how to use easels and all of all those other things. So you want to get signed up for that. Um, I have a special guest, and I just want to bring him on now, and then we'll talk about some of this later. Uh, welcome to John McDonald. Hello, Eric. Yeah, John, I see you're in your studio. I am. Well, welcome. So Thanks. John and I uh, have known each other a lot of years because John comes to my annual Adirondack event. John, have you heard? I have, and very sad to hear that. It's going to be a missing family, um, but I'm already, I've already registered for next year, so I'll be there. Yeah, so uh, I haven't actually announced this to anybody, but the people that have, have been registered, and that is that we got that call yesterday from the camp where we were rescheduled to be in, and they said, look, it's just not possible. The state won't let it happen. Too many people, too dangerous. We just can't make it happen. So uh, I wrote an email last night and it said, you know, kick me in the teeth <laughs> once and I get back up, kick me in the gut another time I get back up. And I, it's like we had to cancel the fine art trip. We had to cancel one of our radio events. We had to cancel, reschedule the plein air convention. Then we had to cancel the plein air convention. And now this man, it's like, give me something to do. That's why we're going to do plein air live. Yes, a great idea, too. So, John, I, I heard a rumor that you had coronavirus. Is that true? Uh, I, I, I may have. My personal physician thinks not, but two other doctor friends, when they listened to my symptoms, uh, thought so. Yeah, I, I fortunately, knock on wood, I rarely get sick, but I was out for two and a half weeks. And, and a lot of the symptoms match those who have had the more mild symptoms. I still haven't been tested. Um, you know, at this point, uh, I, could, I suppose I could get tested for the antibodies, but um, I know that the tests aren't terribly accurate, so I've got my fingers crossed that I actually had it, but <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. There's still so many unknowns. With this. So we'll yeah, see. I, got, I got tested. I had the antibody test, but I don't have them, unfortunately. So, <laughs> yeah. So, John, uh, you're going to be on the faculty of Plein Air Live, and I want to tell people what we're going to be doing. Um, I I decided that everybody needs a reminder of very important basic principles. And, and so we carved out a, 
uh, roughly an hour every day where we can have four different teachers teaching four different basic principles. What are you going to be talking about? It's rather than doing a painting demo, it's not going to be a, about my technique or how I paint, it's gonna be more of a lecture presentation with a lot of visuals, just about values. Um, I know that those who follow me and who've been in my workshops are like, well, of course it'll be about values because that seems to be the my mantra that I'm always stressing. But uh, yeah, so I look forward, I look forward to doing that, get, getting that word out. It, it still never ceases to surprise me how I've had people in workshops come up and say that they've received almost no instruction in values, which is a little bit like a baseball player saying, you know, someone learning to baseball, I've never had, I've never held a bat in my hand. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's that basic. It's, it's a, the foundation of a good painting. Well, and, and I had, I won't, again, no, no names, but uh, I had a very almost world famous painter, uh, somewhat at a very high level, I interviewed on the Plein Air podcast. Uh, you can hear it there, but I'm not going to tell you who it was. And she said, you know, I, I, I painted for years. I had my work in galleries. I was making a great living as an artist. And then I went to a workshop and they taught values. She said, I never heard of values. No one ever taught me. And she said, even after uh, a successful career as a painter, once I learned values, everything got better. Everything came together. Yeah, not, su not surprising. It really is the foundation of a good painting. Is it, there's a common saying that actually my wife first told me who was taking a quilting workshop. And she said her quilting instructor said, well, values do all the work and color gets all the credit. And, and ever since she, I've heard that, I've heard it from painters and quilters. And, you know, if you work, if you work in imagery, if you're an image maker, it applied. Yeah. Values yeah. do all the work and color tends to get the credit. Yeah. I never thought about that for quilting. I guess I'll have to take up quilting. <laughs> yeah, that's a steep learning curve. But there's a lot of great work out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there really is. Uh, that reminds me of a story, but I'm not going to tell it because there's no time for telling stories. John, I want to compliment you uh, on a couple of things. First off, um, your newsletter is the best newsletter on the earth that any artist does when it comes to teaching other artists uh, principles. Uh, I, I know that you put a couple of weeks into each one that you really spend a lot of time. And, and I hear from people constantly. As a matter of fact, I heard from one of your students last week, you were doing an online zoom workshop and she said i've taken 30 workshops she said this was the best workshop i've ever taken in my life she said even though it was zoom i got more out of it than any workshop ever so congratulations on that well thanks i, I should have been recording this obviously <laughs> but no thanks and, and the newsletter I, i'm finding I, I have to say i started it both as, as initially it's just a way of geez maybe i can help people better their paintings without ha their having to go through what I went through, which was a lot of years of struggle and trying to figure it out. Um, but then it quickly kind of dawned on me that, gosh, if these things keep going like this, maybe they'd be nice chapters for a book. But that's uh, that's down the road maybe one of these days. I do enjoy doing them. They are time consuming, but it, it I never run out of topics because uh, it, there's always stuff to examine, explore. Yeah, there's there's so much to remember. I mean, I, I, I've been thinking about putting together a, what I would call a flight list. I used to be a pilot and, you know, you had a checklist of all the things that you had to do before you took off, because if you didn't do them all, you might crash. Yeah. And I almost think that we need a, a pre-flight pre list and then a something that we stop in the middle of it and we say, okay, are we, you know, Talk to me about your edges. Talk to me about your values. You know, is, is this coming in line? What about your big shapes? What about your masses? You know, those kinds of things. It's, it's, I, I, I really, you know, the deeper I get into it, the more, um, both the more simple it seems on the surface. It, it's, it's, I always use the analogy that this is simple, but it's not easy. Um, you know, you're just putting blobs of color of a certain value next to each other and manipulating edges. I mean, come on, how difficult can that be? But but then you think of the drawing that goes into it, the thought that goes into it at the beginning. And, and even, even I'm continually finding little things that seem to push my paintings up to the next level, things that I've been talking about and heard about for years, but never had the self-discipline to use. And one of those in the last year has been doing just 
little thumbnail tonal sketches on location. And my failure rate prior to that in plein air was probably, I would, I would, if I did three paintings, two would fail and one would, one would succeed. And now that's flipped. Just from reminding myself that it's this composition and the value structure. If I don't start out with that at the beginning, it doesn't matter how I handle details and how magnificent my brushwork is and what beautiful color relationships I throw in there. The painting's going to fail. Uh, something as simple as that. And yet every time I look at a great painting, old master or a contemporary artist, they have a great composition and a solid value structure. And it's, 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 it seems so easy. And yet, as you said, there are so many things to remember. And I, there are so many distractions. When we're out there painting, we fall in love with color relationships and sparkles on water and we're chasing the light. And it's so easy to forget to slow down and step back and say, okay, I just did this passage. Does it work for the painting? Um, it's, yeah, it's, the, 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 there are traps, so many traps along the way, so many distractions. You know, you were up here, uh, you and Judson Brown were up here for a couple of days last summer and we painted together and you left behind your sketchbook. You, I know, I felt terrible because it required you to ship it back to me when you're living on an island. That wasn't fair, or near island. Well, well I, was te I was tempted to keep it. I was tempted to say, oh, I shipped it. I don't know what happened to it. It, it it was remarkable. Do you happen to have it nearby? Uh, I, uh, I took it. No, I took it to the house. I take it plein air painting every time to do those little tonal thumbnails. But I, I, uh, I am afraid it's in the house. But I, I will tell you that it, it just again to talk about it. it I'll tell you what. It, I, I don't know if you will be able to do this or not. But maybe when we go on live at it, during plein air live, we're going to talk for a few minutes. Maybe you can pull it out. And, uh, and bring it along and show it to everybody. It is so good that the book itself needs to be published. The sketchbook itself needs to be published because it is, it is some of the best graphic work. And, and I love the notes and the thoughts and what, you know, it's kind of a journal and, and, uh, and the drawings are phenomenal. And you got me started doing it. I went out and I bought the, you know, the gray pens and, and uh, the journal. I'm not anywhere close to you and and i just wish i had the kind of uh background that you have with your illustration background and so on but it is fabulous and so if and when that book gets published you need to talk to your publisher about publishing the sketchbook as part of it well that's a, that that'd be a fun idea although i don't want to give people the wrong idea these aren't finished drawings in most in most cases sometimes i'll draw a flower or a seed pot or something, you know, something I find around the house that's interesting, but most of it's just these little rectangular thumbnails of tonal sketches, either on live or sometimes I'll sit in the house and pull out my camera and, and review some photos I've taken and explore. So a lot of it's, it's just very simple graphic images of very small of, of values, but I'm continually amazed at sometimes a, a drawing that's two and a half inches by an inch and a quarter how I can look at that and, you know, anyone can look at that and it reads spatially, it reads, no details, just five or six simple shapes. And you can tell there's a good painting in there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been really valuable for me over the years and continually trying to avoid the distraction of details and the seduction of color and, and first see those big shapes of value. Does it work? Can I move it? And the difference between a beautiful scene and a painting that works, there are two different animals and we can see a gorgeous scene and want to paint it. But if we don't realize that we're making a painting and not just trying to copy what we see, we, we can fall prey to all sorts of distractions and problems. It's got to work as a painting. So, you know, as you know, as you know, I have a product in an online site where I teach values. It's called Paint by Note. Right. And you have taken values, though, to a much more sophisticated level. And I didn't even know it could be taken to a more sophisticated level until I saw what you were doing. So I'm really excited about seeing what you're going to do on Plein Air Live. Well, thanks. I didn't either. I mean, a lot of this revelation that there are two kinds of values, you know, the, the, the ones within the big shapes, the value structure, and then these little ones within each shape. I didn't really start to realize that until two or three years ago. And a lot of it's just studying the great paintings and how Monet would structure his value sergeant and a lot of the really terrific. So there are so many great Russian painters these days and um, just looking at how they did it and, and how they work with values. So, yeah, it's fun. 
You, you know, you, you need to uh, start saving your money and, and go with me. You're making so much money on your video anyway. So <laughs> yeah, I, I wish, although I will say it's been nice. It's, it's been a pleasant surprise. <laughs> Everybody buy John's video because what I'm about to say is, John, you need to go with me to Russia. I'm taking a group in, in, in September next year. We're going to go to the great Russian museums. We're going to paint in the places where Levitan, Shishkin, all those guys painted. We're going to see their paintings. Uh, we're going to the small villages. It's going to be a phenomenon. So that, you know, yeah. save, save your coin and, and come along. Uh, John, um, because I want to get to the teaching, I'd like to maybe ask you to not talk it about values because you're going to talk about that on Plan Air Live, but maybe can you impart maybe a couple of thoughts for people who are trying to take their painting to a higher level? How do you get there? What everybody struggles with this. How do you kind of go from average to better, better to better? You know, how do you get to a point of excellence? Well, yeah, a good question. And if I had easy answers, obviously I would have applied them all and I'd be much better and more famous than I am, um, such as it is. I, I would I would say oh, I, couple couple hints. One is improve your drawing skills. Um, it is the weakness I see across almost everyone in my workshops. It's something I struggle with when I look at a painting I've done and I think, well, that's a poorly drawn tree. Improve your drawing skills any way you can. Take online sketching classes, work at it, fall in love with drawing and then work at it and work at it and work at it. Um, it, it, I'm realizing it isn't just the ability to draw a form, an outline or a shape that looks three dimensional. The more you improve your drawing skills, I think the more sensitive you become to the relationships between shapes and line. And all of that will translate into better compositions. Um, drawing skills. Number two, I, I think that one of the two things have really helped me. One, slowing down. And secondly, identifying what's essential. Um, there was a terrific artist, late 1800s into the early 1900s, Burge Harrison, who I think sometimes has been considered a tonalist, um, B-I-R-G-E Harrison. He wrote a book, um, I think it's, it's very few chapters that was, was taken from a series of lectures. One of the salient points that jumped out to me and has helped my work is he said at the very beginning of your painting, identify what's absolutely essential and be willing to sacrifice everything else. Instead, we may be attracted to a certain aspect of a landscape and we start to paint it, but then we start to fall in love with everything else around it and want to include it in the painting. And he would he would always say, identify what's essential. And then if there are more things you're interested in, do two or three paintings. Don't try, a painting has to say one thing. So keep it simple. Um, well, I'll tell you, that is so true. And that's what I'm living right now. I was out on the boat painting last night and I was painting. I, I was, I was going to go and paint the sunset. And then I turned around for some reason and I saw this scene. I said, I got to paint that. So I threw the anchor out and I painted that scene. And then I glanced over at the sunset and I thought, how could I incorporate that into this? <laughs> and then I realized, no, and yeah. as a matter of fact, I, I had, I had elements that were fighting with me. And so I smushed those elements down and made them there, but, but didn't bring a lot of attention to them. And it made the painting come alive so much better by doing that. So I think that's great advice. I, I think it happens all the time. And in a, something in a said too, that has always resonated with me as he said, he said, I often, paraphrasing, of course, but he said, I often have to paint details in to paint them out. So I'm always stepping back and I'll say, wow, I really nailed that tree, but it's at the edge of the canvas. The edges are too sharp and I've got too strong value contrast. I have to destroy what I just painted. So be it for the sake of the painting. Um, talk, to I, me, talk to me about that value contrast because you're talking. You, so if, if you've got a tree, let's say it's a pine tree, and that pine tree is against a bright sky. That's pretty much black to white value contrast. Is you're you're saying that that's something that we should avoid? Well, now if you want the eye to go there, then then of course use it. I, I think again, another thing I've become so aware of in the last number of years is that is that it what draws the eye? It's contrast, and there can be contrast in value, color relationships, edges, lines, soft versus hard, shapes, the way it different, the amount of details you use. Sometimes, simply by juxtaposing an area of detail next to an area of simplicity, a larger area, you'll draw the eye there. 
So contrasts are everything, but value contrasts are one of the strongest. So if you want the eye to go, well, I'm going to lean up here, pull a painting off the wall. <laughs> so here's a simple, very simple, misty kind of shape. I'm still Lower it down so we can hear under your mouth because your mouth is blocked. There you go. Okay, good. Uh, it's just a painting that's in progress. There, I'm gonna. I, I'm still tempted to put snow. It's a snowy day in the foreground here, but those shapes will have to be very well designed. But here's a shape of a tree, okay? That's a dark silhouette. I'm kind of reverse mirror, reverse, but here, but it's against the sky. Well, as long as that's in the area of the painting that I want the eye to go to, then I'll use value contrast. But I'm very careful to put any value contrast the bottom or edges of the painting because contrast draw the eye and value contrasts are one of the strongest. So I'm often going back, putting like in us with his details, I might put in some strong value contrast, step back and say, I have to subdue that. So I might take a wide, clean, soft brush and just drag it top to bottom, blur the edges, bring some of the paint into each area so it softens the value contrast, soften the edges. Um, I, I find myself more and more thinking in terms of contrast in a painting, warm versus cool. If I'm dealing with color, light versus dark, if it's if it's value, hard versus soft, if it's, if it's edges. And of course, if you put several contrasts together, a hard edge with a strong light, strong, deep dark, and a good color contrast, you're going to draw the eye there. You, you, but you're a conductor of an orchestra. What is this symphony you're making on canvas? What is the mood of it? Do you want it bright and lively or dark and somber? All of these have to do with manipulating and orchestrating contrasts and where you want those to go. That goes um, back to that checklist. It, it is a checklist. It is. And I think a lot of times, you know, people can balk at this and resist it because it seems so counter to that the poet in us who just wants to go and paint an experience of being in the zone and, and watching this painting unfold on our canvas. Well, two points I'd make. Number one, any great artist who has these masterpieces bloom, underlying that are years and years and years of hard work and serious analytical thinking. It isn't just all play. There has to be a certain amount of intellectual analysis that's going on here. And, and often, the masters, we always say, wow, you made that look easy. You know, you look at a master's work and they make it look easy. Of course they do, because it's coming out of them naturally now after years of having a checklist and going through it so many times that now that checklist is a moment's thought that happens in the fraction of a second. Oh, that's the wrong brushstroke, which, which goes back to your initial question. I think one thing I did see, bumping up the quality of your work, slow down slow down. I used to sit at the easel and paint for five minutes and then I'd step back. And what it took me a while to realize, and I read a little bit about how Cezanne painted and how Sargent painted, and they painted much more slowly and deliberately than the surfaces of their painting would imply. You right. look at Sargent's brushwork and you think he's just doing this. No, he was very slow and very deliberate. So I started, instead of painting for five minutes, I would paint for three brush strokes and step back. Really? Really. And what I found is, is it was a stunt. The, the quality of my work took an immediate jump up. But And I was wondering why. And then, then it's logical. Because if I paint for 10 minutes and I'm making 200 decisions, chances are 50% of those are not good decisions. And I step back and there are so many mistakes on that canvas, I can't tell what's working and what isn't. But if I have a painting that's working and I take three brush strokes, four brush strokes and step back, if it's a bad decision, it jumps out immediately. I can see it. Here's one mistake and everything else is working. I correct it. Now everything's working. I make another couple brush strokes. What I'm finding is that if, if I only have one or two mistakes on a canvas, they jump out. If I have 50, there are so many, I can't tell what's working or what's not. I have 50. Yeah, and I and I still do when I don't slow down. I still do, which is why oh, it's so difficult because plein air, you're fighting the clock and the temptation is to chase the light and you're working at a faster pace than you ever would and you're not stepping back. And strangely oh. enough, I have found my plein air work the success rate go up by not worrying about the time and just slowing down. 
And as my, my mentor friend, Kurt Hansen, always used to say, hey, it's better to end the day with an unfinished painting that's working than a finished painting that's, that you're going to scrape when you get home, right? Yeah, that's, that's great advice. You know, I was just thinking about how I do that in the boat. I'm going to have to put my easel on a board with a roller so I can push it forward to look at it and then pull it back. That's, yeah, I do. Yeah, there's or else no get out of the boat, which is going to be a, li a little bit of a hassle. Yeah, uh, John, I, I, um, I went painting with Richard Schmid one day. And we painted in the garden at the Putney Painters. And I sat up next to him and I wanted to just watch him paint. And he wouldn't let me. He said, no, I, I, you need to paint too. And I watched him and he would, he would look. And then he'd look down. He'd take his palette knife and he'd mix the color. And then he'd look up. He'd look down. And he would spend sometimes five or six minutes looking at a color and mixing it. And then he'd dip his brush in and he'd look at it. And then he'd look down again. He'd look at it. And he would go like this. He'd go, Ooh, just one stroke, right? And that stroke was perfect. And I asked him about it later. And he said, I spent, I wasted so many hours correcting my paintings uh, that I decided just to work on getting it right from the beginning. He said, it's much less, wa much less of a waste of time if I sit there and get the color exactly right and I get the brush stroke exactly right. He said, then, then I don't don't throw, you know, throw away so many paintings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm finding that, that true as well. And, and that deliberation also, you know, includes those little tonal sketches at the beginning. It's just step by step starting out right. And, and I, I, I find, you know, some people, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but you look at someone like a sergeant or a Richard Smith, so much talent, you, you can't help but think that there, you assume there wasn't a lot of thinking to it. It was spontaneous. And, I don't know. For me, I have to think about it, but I have found that slowing down and just being more thoughtful has led to much better painting. And, and it has, the painting hasn't lost its energy. Yeah. It, it doesn't look as if, you know, the times I get super tight is usually, and then ruin a painting by overworking it is often when I'm not stepping back and asking, did I really need that brush stroke? No, I really didn't. Well, let me get rid of it. Take it out. Well, John, this has been a pleasure. I've got so much more I want to talk to you about. We'll, we'll chat live on Plein Air Live. And, uh, and I know you're coming down to Texas to do another video. This will be your third. And uh, hopefully I'll be hanging out at the house when you're there. Good. So Good to see you. It, it'll be nice. And, and, of course, come up this summer and, and we'll paint together. I know you were going to come up last week or two weeks ago, and then we gave you this Plein Air Live project, and, and you had to cancel. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Okay. I'll, I guess. Uh, I guess I got to schedule redo the schedule. Yeah, but that's fine. Yeah. It'll, it'll be great to see. I hope to get out later this summer, and I'll see you just online in just a, a week or so. Yes. Uh, thanks again, John, and I'll see you uh, next week. Take care, Eric. Thanks All a right, lot. Bye. Bye. John McDonald, and, and thank you to John McDonald. I guess I better get to my work here, the promise of, of what I said I was going to do. And I have a presentation prepared for you, and uh, I'm not finding it. So this is, this is interesting. This, is, this technology is, is always going to bring me down. That's all I'm saying, right? So let's see if I can, I can find that presentation. Oh, there, there we go. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, seven ways that you can become a known artist. Let me see if I can share my screen now. There we go. Okay, so seven ways to become a known artist. Uh, I was chatting with a friend the other day, and I said, you know, what do you want? What, what are your goals? And um, he said, well... I want to be a known artist. I said, well, what does that mean? And, and so we went through this process. And so I want to go through the process that I told him. And I also want to show you some things that can amplify your career. Now, being known is a decision. You don't have to be known. There's no right or wrong. But let's talk about how to amplify your career and become a seven, in seven ways. The, the very first thing is you want to start with the question, why? Why do I want to become known? What is it that I want? And now, and now you, you have to, I, every presentation I start with, I always talk about goals. We're going to get into that. But you start with why. Do I, do I want to become uh, a well-known artist because uh, I want to make money? Uh, is it about fame? Is it about helping others? 
you know, what is it about? You, you get to pick one. You can't pick all three. Now, eventually, you can do all three. You know, I, I'm doing a lot of things now, but when I started out, I had to start out with one thing. See, what you've got to do is understand that you will never get anywhere in life if you're trying to do 50 different things at once, and they're all equally important. So you get to pick one thing. You need to define your goals, and that goal, you need an 80% goal. Now, I have, for my company, I have three goals, three big goals. One of them is an 80% goal. The other two are secondary. Everything else becomes tertiary. Now, that doesn't mean I don't work on other things, but I I really focus on one thing, and you want an 80% goal. Now, the second thing you want to be thinking about is creating a timeline. Now, this is obviously old dates, but What does your timeline look like? You see, you can look at this as a long-term thing or a short-term thing. Now, if you're one of those people that you're you're like me, you like want everything now. And the hardest part for me is slowing down. And that's what John McDonald was just talking about. You got to be willing to slow down. You cannot, no matter how good your mind is, you probably cannot accomplish everything you want to accomplish in a really, really, really short time, like one year. Years go by pretty quickly. So what you want to do is start asking yourself, what do you want to do down the road? So for instance, I've got a big project. It's a secret project I'm working on. I know that it's going to take me three years to do that project. I'm already working on it. I'm already uh, uh, contracting people to do it. I know it's going to be needed in three years. And so I'm working on it now. So and it's not my number one goal, but it's something I'm working on. So think about your timeline. The next thing is you've got two primary resources. You have time and you have money. Now, Elon Musk, I read an interview with him the other day. He's the guy that founded PayPal and Tesla and others. He's a, a, a billionaire. And Elon Musk said when he wanted to make the impossible possible, he committed to working 120 hour work weeks. He said that in the interview, he said, you can overcome a lot of things by putting a lot of time into a lot of things. He said, it's a decision we make. He said, I don't don't waste my time playing golf. I don't waste my time doing anything but working. Uh, He said, now I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to succeed. Uh, and he's now working 80 hours a week, which is twice what most people work. He said, if you want to get something impossible done, do in one year what everybody else takes three years to do. And so that's how you do it, is you you look for time. Now, if you really want to launch a career, you really want to make something big happen, you have to work long hours. Now, I'm not a 120-hour work uh, I, a 120 hour a week person, but I was, and I was an 80 hour a week person, but I'm not now because now I have accomplished some things. And so now I have the, the motivation. I have the, uh, uh, the, I've developed the, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Can't think of the word. Anyway, there are two primary resources that time and money, right? So you can have take, take a lot of time, or you can take a lot of money. And you can overcome a lot of things with money, but you cannot overcome all things with money, right? Some things just take time no matter what. The perfect combination for speed is time and money. If you can have some money to put towards a project, sometimes it's about hiring somebody else to help you do some things, maybe hire a virtual assistant. Sometimes it's about some other the other things to bring you visibility. But if you take time plus money, you get speed. Now, um, the number one thing that I, I think of the seven things, number one is define your exact measurable goals. Take a piece of paper, write down every goal that you can possibly think of. And now ask yourself, which goal is the most important if I don't accomplish any of the others Which goal is the most important? And circle it and write number one. Now, which one is the second most important? And write number two and so on. But 
stop at number three and take the sheet and throw it away because you don't need it because you've got three goals. Now you ask yourself, which goal am I going to spend 80% of my time on? Which one is it? I'm not going to spend 20% on one and 50% on another, you know, and so on. I, what you want to do is say, I'm going to crush that one goal and not go to goal number two. I might be working on it in my extra time, but I'm going to crush goal number one uh, first and foremost. And it has to be exact, you know, saying, well, I want to become known. That's not exact. Exactly. How do you want to become known? Who are you known by? What is, how do you define once you've accomplished it? Tell me what it looks like exactly once you're there and then break it into steps break it into weekly, monthly, measurable goals, and that's the first thing. The second thing is define targets for maximum visibility. Now, what I mean by that is what are the things that you could do that will give you maximum visibility? Now, I, I will caution you. If you're not ready, visibility will hurt you. And you've got to be really careful about that. You've got to be sure you're ready. Now, let me give you an example. I owned a radio station in Salt Lake City. And I went to my board of directors and I said, listen, I want to get the station known by everybody. And I want to really do this big promotion. I got this great idea. We're going to create this, this uh, newspaper back. This is pre-internet. We're going to create this newspaper about the radio station and about music and about all these things that would be interesting to people. We're going to create this newspaper and, and we're going to mail it to every home in Salt Lake City. And I went to the board and they said, how much is that going to cost? I said, it's going to cost $200,000. But what's going to happen is it's going to make everybody aware of us. It's going to make, make our uh, radio station audience bigger. It's going to make our advertising bigger. And so the board approved it and we mailed it out. It actually hurt us because what I wasn't realizing is that we weren't really ready to promote. We didn't have our act together. We didn't sound as good as we, so people went and sampled us, didn't like us. Our ratings went down. Our advertising went down. So you've got to make sure that you're ready. And the only way to know if you're ready is to get outside feedback, get people who know that, you know, you're not going to get, you're going to get compliments from your mother and, and, and your friends, but go to somebody who's going to be a critical thinker who knows this stuff who's going to say, like John said, hey, you need to work on the contrast uh, there. You need to work on your edges. You need to work on this or that. Make sure that you're ready. Now, we're never all 100% ready, but you've got to get to the point where you don't actually create a problem for yourself because if you advertise and promote yourself then uh, and, and you're not working, you're not doing a good job, you're not working, your paintings aren't working, all of a sudden you're going to develop a reputation of being an artist that's not cooked yet. So you don't want to do that. So you define targets for maximum visibility. Targets would be things like art magazine articles. Uh, it might be getting articles on, uh, so, you know, so, some, you know, top list for Instagram, you know, it might be the hundred best artists. I've seen friends on those. You, you want to find, find out who can give you visibility in what ways, you know, for instance, a target, for maximum visibility might be getting uh, invited into pre to West or uh, having your artwork as featured as a living artist in something like the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction. You know, those are the big, 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 big things. And so uh, you want to make those things goals. Now, Matt Smith told me it took him, I think he said either nine or 11 years of applying to get into the pre to West. This is Matt Smith. I mean, he's amazing. But he obviously, they felt that he wasn't ready yet. And then finally, they kept watching him and they said, he's ready. He's in, you know, but what a huge difference it makes in your reputation. Number three is find eight hours a day to work on your marketing. Now, you're saying, wait a minute, I got a family. I got to paint. I got to run errands. I got all this stuff I got to do. How can I find eight hours a day to work on my marketing? Well, you can find it. You have to find it if you really want to get somewhere. Now, if, if you want to find four hours a day, it's going to take you twice as much time. Instead of one year, it's going to take you two years. You want to reduce that down in half again, it's going to take you four years. If you want to amplify and amplify fast, you got to spend eight hours a day doing it. So that means, you know, you work all day. And this is what I do. And, and, and I still do this, you know. 
I, I was up till one o'clock in the morning working last night. So, uh, I, you know, I work on one project and then I work on another project and, you know, I go eat dinner. I spend a little time with the family, but instead of watching television or doom scrolling on TV or on Instagram or something, I am working. And so you, you have to be willing to make certain sacrifices. Now, if I wanted to speed that up, I would increase the number of hours. Right now, I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. And sometimes I take time off and I don't do it. But you have to decide. But if you really want to move things fast, that's how you do it. Number four is ethically, you want to leverage successful people. And when I say ethically, leveraging successful people is a no-no unless you have their buy-in, their permission. You know, let me give you an example. You know, people will tag me on uh, something on an Instagram post, and I don't want it up on my page because it's something I don't I, I don't buy into or agree with. And if that happens, I, you know, that's to me that's not ethical. Uh, if you're looking, you know, you want to look for ways to leverage successful people. So let me give you a, a couple of ideas. I have a friend. A, a very good artist was trying to launch a career and uh, became very close with two very famous artists and decided that together the three of them were going to launch an art show. So that's the halo effect. What I call a halo is you're getting the glow of the halo of the other artist. And so uh, because these two other artists said, you know what, you're pretty good. Let's do a show together. What happened? Now, all of a sudden, it's like, well, these two artists wouldn't do this show unless this artist was good because they just they wouldn't do that. Right. So that would be leveraging other people. It you can leverage other people in other ways, like you can get people to give you testimonials. You know, somebody, you know, somebody famous like Joan Stern. I remember he did a testimonial for uh, for Lori Putnam. And she was like all excited because he said this about her and she put that in all of her marketing that that lifts her up. So think of ways that you can leverage people. You can leverage them for introductions. You can leverage them for shows. You can leverage them to be included in something that they're doing. So look for ethical ways, but make sure it's ethical. Number five, be seen and noticed everywhere. Now, I will tell you about Joanne Manji if you haven't noticed. Joanne Manji uh, is one of our best-selling art instruction videos, in spite of the fact that it's a, a category that we weren't sure was going to take off because she, she does a, a video on painting dogs and she does a video on painting horses. And when we launched her thing at the plein air convention, we, we put her on the stage. Well, she had buttons that she handed out to everybody about, see, you know, see Joe and Manji on stage. She had flyers. She did all kinds of things. She went up and danced on stage because she wanted to get noticed. And her room was packed. Uh, you saw her on, on, on day 100. She managed to get me to invite her on day 100. I invited her, actually, but because she's top of mind and she's always sending me things, I'm noticing her. And I thought, well, that'll be somebody that'll be fun to put on there. And so you want to look for ways to go out of your way to be seen and to get noticed every possible place you can be again once you're ready. Number six, get on platforms which elevate your status. So I'm uh, working on a national television show. I have a, a deal with a, a, a national television network. Uh, it's going to put me in front of 20 million people per episode. By getting on that platform, assuming I'm able to raise the, the rest of the $600,000, I got part of it raised, by getting on that platform, I'm going to be able to amplify what I'm doing 100x or 200x because that platform is going to put me in front of 20 million people every week. So how will that help me? Well, that's going to help me teach more people to paint because my goal is to teach a million people to paint. It's going to help me uh, expose people to other things that I'm doing, the plein air movement, and help them become a part of it. It's going to help me get my museum built, you know, things like that. So you want to look for what are, what are platforms? Well, platforms might be people's blogs. You know, I just got invited onto uh, a podcast. A any podcast that, that wants to interview me 
I'm going to jump on it. You, you, you want to be on, you want me on your podcast. I'm going to be there as long as I'm allowed to talk about some of my stuff, because that's a platform. Get somebody to blog about you, get somebody to write about you, get a story about you, get, uh, you know, get yourself on somebody's YouTube thing or get yourself interviewed on my YouTube thing. You know, whatever it is, look for platforms to, because these will elevate your status. You know, John McDonald's uh, more elevated today because a few thousand people have watched this or will have watched it by the end of the day. And even more people will know about John. And number, number seven is advertise with domination. And what I mean by that is that, hang on a second, I got to hang up my phone. Uh, advertise with domination. You know, most people think one ad is going to do it for them. The best possible way is to dominate an individual media, right? You, you know, it, if you have an ad, like let's say Lori Putnam has been in every issue of Fine Art Connoisseur for the last seven years. You know, she dominated. Now, she started out with smaller ads, then went to half-page ads, then to full-page ads, and so on. But she dominated it, and we watched her career rise. It was so amazing. Now, she's the one who did it. She's, she's good. She's working hard in every way. She's doing all of these things. And, and this combined with it, we just watched her, her career rise, and it continues to rise. But, you know, what will happen to anyone, if they lose that domination, they start getting to the point where they say, well, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't need it anymore. Everybody knows who I am. The problem is 10% are lost every year. This is attrition. You lose 10% of awareness every year unless you stay visible. There's always new people coming in and there's always old people coming out. That's why I explain things every single day because there's always new people discovering this every single day. And so you want to just dominate everything you possibly can in a positive way, of course, uh, rather than spreading your advertising across three or four publications. That's not smart. Dominate one until you're making enough money that you can keep that one and then add another one. But don't spread it because if you don't dominate, it won't work for you. So that's uh, kind of an overview of the top seven things. Now, here's a resource for you. My book, it's called Make More Money Selling Your Art. You can find it on artmarketing.com or Amazon. And I also have a series of videos that streamline art video. All can be helpful to you. That is seven ways that you can become uh, a well-known artist. So I hope that's been helpful to you. Uh, I want to remind everybody, I think this is a really, really critical day for you. And that is that Plen Air Live is today is the last day, midnight Pacific time. Midnight Pacific time, the last chance to register to save $100 price and every category goes up by $100. We've had a massive number of people join this. This is going to be the first, first ever historic virtual plein air experience where we're getting the entire plein air world together. It is also the first time in history there's been a virtual art conference. This is literally the first virtual online art conference that's ever taken place. You want to be part of that history. And, and this is a great way to be part of that history. And we have, uh, we, we put this together very fast. We, we knew that there were a lot of people who could not come to the plein air convention because of their concerns about virus. We knew there were people who were, were uh, signed up that decided to cancel. We knew there were people who have never been to one before and they want to get a feel for the experience. We know there's just a lot of new people who want to get to know these top artists. And so, uh, and we didn't know when we launched this three weeks ago, we did not know that we were going to have to cancel the plein air convention. And now today we have to cancel the, our, our Adirondack painting event, which we've done. This would have been our 10 year anniversary. So next year will be our 10 year. Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, this has been a hard year because, you know, we make our living on live events and it's been really hard. So uh, we think that this will be a great way for you to get a, a fantastic experience. Uh, there's a lot of really wonderful teachers, Susie Baker, Lynn Boyer, Jill Carver, Kim K. Spear, Scott Christensen, Carrie Curran, Laurel Daniel, Andy Evenson, Rose Franson, Albert Handel, Mike Hernandez, Leon Holmes, Chong Wong, Kathleen Hudson, Jane Hunt, Charlie Hunter, Nancy King Mertz, Paul Cratter, John McDonald, Kevin McPherson, Sherry McGraw, Ned Mueller, Joe Paquette, Antonin Passenard from France, 
John Potoshnik, Rose Schuring from Holland, Catherine Statz, and John Stern, plus Haney Joe Summers from England and Jim Woodard. So that's Plein Air Live. And, and by the way, we've added some more faculty members today. We've got three galleries that are joining us. I'll tell you about them tomorrow. Three galleries are going to talk about how to get into art galleries and how to have the ideal relationship with art galleries. And you're going to want to hear that. That alone will be worth, worth the price of admission. You can come to Plein Air Live for one-tenth of what you would have spent. You know, easily you get on an airplane, you go to the Plein Air Convention, you buy a ticket, get a hotel, you get a rental car, you get meals and expenses. You're easily dropping 2500 3000 bucks. This is for about a tenth of that. Of course, the price goes up today. So if you get in today, this is a great opportunity. And we have a 100% money-back guarantee. If by the end of day one, you think it's not for you, or you, you just think we didn't do a good job with it, we will pull you off and we will give you your money back. You won't have to watch the rest of it and uh, you'll be secure. So it's money back guarantee. But you need to consider doing this because today is the last day. So thank you for watching today. And remember today at 3 p.m. Uh, oh, we've got prizes. I didn't give away prizes yet, did I? Okay, so I'm going to get the prizes and give those away. You would think I would get that down. So uh, yesterday we announced my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art. And the winner is, oh, that's, uh, that's a typo, Jane Merrill East from Houston. And also we're giving away a Plein Air Magazine digital subscription. Plein Air Magazine is the number one selling art magazine in America. And the digital has 30% more content. That goes to John Zaleski in Welland, Ontario. Be sure in the comments to say where you're from, because if you're out of the country, we try to give an out of the country prize away every day. Now today, the prize is going to be two easel brush clips. You clip these on your easel, and they uh, they just make your brushes right there at at your uh, eye level and easy at your fingertips. I take the brushes that I use most and put them in there. And then if there are other brushes, uh, they, they usually don't get used. But that way, I'm not digging through brushes, dropping things on the ground all the time. So. Uh, make sure you leave a comment for the easel brush clip, okay? So I think I've covered everything today. Remember today at 3 p.m. at Streamline Art Video, a uh, free tutorial from Randall Sexton, Brush Strokes with Energy and Movement, and that's going to be at 3 o'clock today. All right, you guys, I'm going to go to the comments real quick and say hello. Uh, congratulations to the winners. Thank you guys for watching, and make sure you share this and and. If you think that the, the marketing uh, was of value to someone and you think you know of someone who could use it, somebody wants to build their career, pass that on to them. And uh, also, if you have not found them, all of the ones I've done now, 103 days in a row, uh, all of them are on YouTube at Streamline Art Video. So you can go there and go through them all. We're eventually gonna pull them down, but all the videos we've done every day for 103 days, uh, the replays, the videos, the discounts uh, will, will be, when you watch it, the discounts will be there and grab those. And this is a great opportunity to keep your head in the game, keep your mind out of COVID, keep your mind out of all the crazy stuff that's going on and just focus on your art, focus on staying upbeat and positive and finding something fun to do. Because if you do something fun, you're not going to feel good. You know, um, I, I was working last night because I I started doom scrolling and I started going through Facebook. I thought, I don't want to hear this. You know, everybody's got their opinions. I just didn't want to hear it. So I started unfriending people. And then I thought, I don't even want to do that. I don't want to get mad. So I just went back to work and had a great time. And I was having fun. I slipped out uh, during work time and went painting yesterday in my boat. And that was fun. I'm going to slip out tonight and go painting. And, and, I'm going to take advantage of every minute I possibly can to keep my head in the game because I do not want to get poisoned by all the negativity that's going on. So uh, I hope you guys found this valuable. I am seeing people from all over. Uh, oh, somebody asked me yesterday, what do I need to do to get ready for Plein Air Live? Well, there's, uh, there's a couple of things I would think. First off, have a notepad. You're not allowed to record it, so have a notepad. Secondly, if you record it, we can detect that you're recording it and then you'll lose your entry pass. So uh, can't record it, can't share it. You can take notes. Uh, you want to get involved as much as possible. 
if we're having fun, we're just dancing around, just do that. You know, even though you're going to feel studio, uh, crazy, do it in your studio, get involved. It'll help you get your head in the game. Make comments, lots of comments. Uh, you can go on live. When we go on live, we're going to do live painting. We've got video of beautiful places for a couple of hours. And so you're going to see the changing light and everything. And uh, so that's an opportunity for you. And you can, you can come on, show us your work. Uh, there are places you can post your work. There are lots of ways you can interact. You can interact with the vendors. We have a lot of really great vendors. And, and they, these people have really stepped up and made it possible for you to be there. Our platinum sponsors, uh, Royal Talons, they make Cobra paints. They make Rembrandt paints. Uh, they also have a, an acrylic line, uh, and, and they let make a lot of papers and other things. So Royal Talents, uh, La Papa, the Laguna Plein Air painters of Amer uh, uh, Laguna Plein Air papers, painters, thank you for your support. Uh, and Savoir Faire, they also, they're a distributor. They bring in the Sennelier brand. They have pastels. They have, uh, I think, Fabriano watercolor paper. They, you know, they, they bring in a lot of things. So they're sponsoring. Uh, gold sponsor is Michael Harding Paints from England. And our silver sponsors are Multimedia Art Board, which is the lightweight travel board. Golden, uh, Golden makes uh, golden acrylics. They make uh, golden open acrylics, which are acrylics that don't dry fast. So if you don't want to use oil paints, they paint a lot like oil paints. They don't dry as fast. And you can even use retardants so that they don't dry even when you want. You can make them dry slower. And they're really great for the field or for traveling. And then uh, Dixon Ticonderoga, which has uh, a, a line of pencils and a line of other products, including the May Miri paint brand, and then Princeton art brushes. And so these people are there to support you. And I hope that you'll go to their website and check them out. And they will have their own rooms. They'll have demos for you. They're going to be participating in a big way. So this will be a chance for you to get to know the vendors. You know, normally at the plein air convention, what happens is everybody watches, let's say they watch Charlie Hunter, and they all rush to the Royal Talons booth and they buy up all the Cobra paint colors that he's using. Uh, or, you know, somebody will mention uh, another color and they'll rush or they'll mention a brush and they'll rush. So these people are there for you and they figured out a way that you can rush to them and you can get their products right away. And that way they'll ship them to you. You can be uh, playing with their products right away. And the thing that's really critical, somebody else asked me about how to be prepared. I think what I would do is I'd have a bunch of boards, a bunch of canvases, and I'd be thinking about watching and maybe even having put the palette out, maybe even painting along, doing some of the exercises that people like John McDonald are talking about. Get your sketch pad, use that. And also uh, make sure that you have your paints out for the paint along. Now, you don't have to do any painting. You can just sit and watch. But we do encourage you to get involved and, and be a part of it. This is historic. This is the first time in the history of plein air painting that the world of plein air painters are coming together. We've got people from England and Scotland and Ireland and uh, uh, Spain and Norway and Sweden and, uh, oh gosh, Costa Rica, um, Brazil, Africa. Um, boy, I'm forgetting Egypt. A uh, lot, of, lot of people from around the world, and you do not want to miss being a part of that. And we have international instructors as well. So from England, from France, from Australia, and from Holland. And these are the top people at their game there. And so you want to be a part of this. This is historic. First time there's ever been a virtual art conference. And all virtual means is you're watching it just like this. You're making comments just like you're, you're suggesting. And... Um, so anyway, uh, if you are in the uh, uh, if, if you're in the VIP, you're going to get a package of goodies with the logo on it. It's kind of like a, a status item. You know, all this stuff's going to come to you. Depending on when you sign up, you'll have it either before or if you if or it'll come in right after. So if you're in the in the medium uh, category, you get some goodies. If you're in the other, you get replays. So there's a lot for all of you. And if you can't make the dates, just get it so you can get the replays and then you will have a great great time now i'm also asked all the time are we going to sell this afterwards no we made an agreement with the artist this is a one-time view a couple artists were asking me this yesterday one-time view only you know that you you can i mean you can watch it on the replays and some of you if you get the vip 
you get a one year of replay, plus you're getting $400 worth of videos, plus you're getting a, a mastermind with me on your marketing uh, that's worth a thousand bucks. So that's a really, really great deal. And it's less money than you would have spent if you were going to the convention without all your expenses. And so uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can get, but you want to get signed up today because no matter which category you're in, you're going to save a hundred bucks if you do it before tonight, midnight Pacific time. Okay. Um, let's see. I think uh, I, I've checked the comments and I think, uh, could I possibly do that checklist on a sticker? Uh, that checklist, what checklist are you talking about, Lisa? I, I'm not sure. You mean the checklist for the flight list that I talked about with John? I will work on that as a project. It's not going to happen anytime soon, but I will get it done. Yes. Thank you. Values, values, values. Thank you. All right, guys, have a terrific day. Thanks for watching. Went a little long today, but I hope it was valuable. Make sure to leave a comment so that you can win a possible prize. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.